All right, so I'm going to talk about how bots can make money and uh, share some insights on the subscription model that we uh, use at Zoom.ai. So here's a little intro about me. I'm the VP of Growth at Zoom. I've been commercializing AI and NLP technologies for just over 12 years now. I've been building bots and assistants and agents, whatever you want to call them, since 2013. And I like to think of myself as a full-time thinker, part-time savant. So a couple of past bot projects include an SMS-based concierge bot for the hospitality industry, a natural language bot for sports news and statistics, a digital assistant for families suffering from Alzheimer's disease, a dating bot focused on bot-to-bot -bot communications, and an HR bot for pre-interview screening. So what is Zoom? So Zoom grew out of the frustration of our team being knowledge workers and being forced to manage all of the operational tasks that take up a lot of time in your day. And time is the one thing that holds people and companies back from accomplishing more. So what we built is an automated virtual assistant for your workday where you can offload and automate operational tasks and focus on your actual jobs to be done. So some of the tasks include calendar management, meeting preparation, warm introductions, travel logistics, reminders, and a few more. Uh, we're available on 11 platforms, including Messenger, Slack, Skype, and the other eight. <laughs> so uh, here we go. So building bot businesses. So I think the key here is focusing on the business and not just the bot. I think that's one thing that we saw in the mobile app world in the sense that a lot of people were just building an app for the sake of it or they had some feature or idea and they never really thought about the business behind it. And I think it's really important to figure out how you're going to make money before you actually start building your product. And you can do that through customer development and discovery and research and figuring out what kind of business model makes the most sense for the bot business that you're trying to build. And uh, I guess the key there is don't take the field of dreams approach where uh, if you build it, they will come because that is not how it works. So here are some ways to make money with your bot business. Uh, cost per conversation, sponsored content, affiliates, research, lead generation, e-commerce, and bots as a service, which is what we do at Zoom.ai. So cost per conversation. I think people are willing to pay for things like advice and companionship via messaging already. I think we've seen it on you know, SMS services, we've seen it in mobile applications, and I think it's you know, a really strong business model and use case uh, once you kind of hit your critical mass and you've proven your value proposition to your users. So as bots become more sophisticated, people will become more comfortable actually paying for that type of service. And uh, I think one great way of doing this is leveraging the credit-based model so that users don't have to continuously enter payment details. So you can have them kind of like top up their account and pay for the credits and then use the credits towards each conversation that they want to do. So I'm not sure if they're really doing it yet, but I see one bot that could really excel in this space is Sensei. They've already got a ton of traction and a ton of users, and I think it just makes sense for them as a business. So next is uh, sponsored content. So this has been a trend that's been picking up for the past couple of years, well, more than a few, I guess, now. Your business, your bot, whatever kind of company you are. And content is often viewed as being having been created by the outlet, not just the brand themselves. And I think a really good example of this is the BuzzFeed bot. BuzzFeed's kind of been the king of sponsored content for the past little while. And I see them really kind of owning that domain, at least for now, until someone builds something better. So next, we're going to talk about affiliates. So this model has been leveraged by entrepreneurs for years. I've done it with you know, tons of my different businesses that I've launched. And basically, find products that people frequently search for and then figure out a way to attract those people and offer additional value in regards to you know, search like tips, tricks, or any type of additional content that may be valuable to them. And then you use affiliate links or native integration to facilitate transactions. It's very simple very easy to implement, and there's tons of sites where you can go find different companies that offer affiliate programs. 
I think one bot that's doing a great job of this right now is Snap Travel. So they do uh, hotel and flight bookings. And uh, it's really fun and easy and seamless experience. So next I'm going to go into research. So brands will pay you to do research for them. And you can ask simple this or that questions, or you can allow free form text input. It's really up to you and the type of experience that you're trying to deliver. So you don't necessarily have to be a question and answer bot. Uh, you can still incorporate this you know, into your bot business with you know, having a different type of focus. And if the audience is niche, then companies will have an interest in conducting research campaigns with your audience. And I think one company that's you know, starting to do this really well is Swelly. I suggest checking it out if you haven't already. It's uh, really fun. So next I'm going to talk about lead generation. So here you deliver insights and information to your users. And then you pass along the user to a business who sells services or products. It's similar to the affiliate model, but instead of just sending them through a link, you kind of pass them the user information and allow them to market and cater to your audience. So it must be in line with the content that you're delivering. You don't want to be you know, a fashion bot and then start you know, pushing those leads to a sports you know, company like ESPN. It just doesn't make sense. And uh, the way that this works is the commission's paid by company to the bot. So one example of this, I think, is uh, the Breaking Sports bot. They're doing some cool stuff with a bunch of the companies in the daily fantasy sports space, and I think they do a really good job there. So next is e-commerce or direct sales, retail sales. Uh, so this is the most straightforward model for B2C bot companies, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you know, users can browse or they can be pushed content through subscriptions. Uh, users make the purchases directly via chat. And it's similar to transactions that consumers are already comfortable with on web and mobile. And uh, an example of that is EvaBot. I think they're uh, you know, really doing some cool stuff in the gifting space. So next is uh, where I probably have the most insights and information to share, which is bots as a service, or the SaaS model. So B2B customers are already familiar with this model. Uh, you know, there's little education required to understand how the transaction will work. Uh, you know, it can be simple with, you know, tiers, or you can have it complex with, you know, charging per seat, per task, or per request. Uh, I think a really good example of a company that's done, you know, extremely well with this model is Statsbot. Uh, so here's the Zoom.ai model. So we offer our freemium tier, which is free for anyone to use. Uh, we, you know, provide a, a lot of different features and functionality, and we cap or we have a quota on certain features uh, to try and push them towards monetization and paying for the professional tier. And then what we're really focused on is you know, selling this to the enterprise and being able to give an assistant to everyone in the workplace and allowing the enterprise to deploy this organization wide so that anyone can make use of it and have more time throughout their day to be more productive. So here's some major keys that we've learned so far. <laughs> so bot CRO. So getting users to convert from free to premium is not an easy task. Um, some things that we've played around with uh, and that we've learned is you know, allowing the user to try all the core functionality in the free version at least three times. So first we tried it with one, two, five, ten, and we really kind of honed in on you know, three, you, three times using that feature was like that ideal number to really you know, give them you know, a chance to experience what you're offering and then try and push them towards the upgrade path. Uh, you do not want to try and push the users or customers to sign up from, for premium right from the get-go. So we, we tried that for a little bit when we dropped our free tier and it just didn't work at all. I think it's too new to a lot of people. People are still figuring out you know, what bots are, especially when you're dealing with you know, productivity tools or anything in the B2B space. So I think it's really important to have you know, a freemium tier where you can onboard them and explain them the value proposition through the onboarding and through the bot. And you can use machine learning and all the user data to personalize that experience and kind of build out that hook model so that they you know, are more inclined to come back and continuously use what you've built. 
And uh, one other key component of conversion rate optimization is really clearly communicating the unique value proposition so that users understand what the premium offering is. I think that's one thing that we're still you know, experimenting with. Uh, you know, it's you know, what features do we include in freemium? Which ones do we include in professional? You know, how do we communicate why they should be paying for professional? So uh, if anyone's got any tips, uh, I'm open ears. So next is uh, value. So I think focusing on value and you know, really communicating that value to your users and customers is key. Nobody's going to pay for something that doesn't provide them with real value. It's just not gonna happen. So you really need to define your value through the eyes of your customer. And you can do this by looking at the four types of value. So there's functional, monetary, social, and psychological. And we at Zoom have spent you know, a lot of time and a lot of research figuring out how this taps into each of those four key values and how we can you know, message that and communicate that to our audience. So thank you. And uh, there's a free month of pro for uh, everyone here on zoom.ai. Just uh, use the code botanist. Um, it's a tricky one. I have not built a bot that does that. I've built a couple apps and it's always, you're always kind of walking a fine line when your customer base doesn't really have the means or the ability to pay for what you're offering. So in a lot of cases, it's them going to their parents and saying, hey, you know, give me your credit card. I really want this or I really need this. Uh, so I think one, you know, one strategy that you can implement there is, you know, being able to educate your users and your potential customers on how to communicate, you know, why their parents should be paying for that and why they should need it. Thanks. Uh, on the, uh, the, the SaaS uh, premium model that you guys have had so far, uh, what, what's the, you probably can't give me the exact number, but, uh, how do you feel about your churn after uh, you know people convert to pay? Are are, are people staying longer, uh, or is the churn pretty high? I mean, I'm just, this is just coming from we we're also a SaaS model. And we noticed that uh, on a premium model, the churn is just horrendous because people weren't bought into the service when they started using it. So, yeah. yeah, I think it depends on the platform. You know, being on eleven different you know communication tools and uh, messaging platforms, I think we've kind of learned a lot about the different audiences on each of them. And you know, I agree with you, I think retention is uh, you know, uh, something that everyone in the bot community really needs to work on and figure out how we're gonna increase that. I think I read a recent number where you know, overall retention rate for bots is like at 9.5%. And I think with apps, it's about 38 to 40%. Um, so we, we do see you know, a massive increase in user retention once they've converted to the professional plan. I don't think anyone has actually canceled the professional plan or downgraded from it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's one thing that we're always kind of experimenting with and figuring out ways to you know, really hook the user and how to bring them back into the platform. And we do offer both kind of like an active and a passive service in the sense that you, we, we, we push a lot of information to the users. So they may not be you know, sending messages to our bot and communicating with it on a daily basis, but I think constantly keeping our product and our service top of mind you know, is a way to kind of you know, continuously bring them back week after week. Of the 11 platforms you're on, which one is the equivalent of iOS and having fewer users but more willingness to pay? Um, hmm, that is a good question. Uh, I'm trying to think. I think email, actually. <laughs> Surprising. <laughs> Surprisingly, we we kind of like wanted to ignore email altogether. Like we're not, we 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 never make the argument that email is dead. Email is still the prime line of communication, especially in the enterprise world. But we always, you know. We always built our company in a way that it was you know, messenger first. 
And surprisingly, you know, a lot of people still like to use the product on email. So it's, it's, it's a smaller audience, but yeah. Hi, Matt. Uh, first of all, thank you for using EvaBot and Alexander. Uh, my question is, uh, we face this problem a lot because, um, which is with the subscription. Um, so we have some of the teams who use us on Slack and some of them use us through email. Now the problem which happens is, uh, on Slack people use it as a team, but sometimes our product, they want to use it beyond the team, right? Uh, so the, our problem becomes, you know, when, uh, when it's all about who, who is going to save the car, right? Uh, it's not the company, it's not the team, it's, it's maybe a product manager who saves the car, but then the other challenge is uh, they might, you know, the sales team might not want the marketing team to basically use their car. So do you face those kind of problems and if yes, how do you solve this, like, you know, the subscription, like who saves the car problem? Um, so right now, it's kind of on a one-to-one -one basis, at least with our professional users. With an enterprise, it's more of an enterprise sales model. Uh, so, you know, the organization's paying for it and it's deploying it organization-wide. I think, uh, I can't say the name of our, you know, enterprise client, but I think we might be, you know, one of the first bots to deploy organization-wide within a large enterprise. Um, so we, we haven't really faced that issue yet. But I'm sure we will, and as soon as we do, I'll be more than willing to, willing to share those insights. I think you kind of covered it. I was going to ask you about how you think about the enterprise sales motion specifically, you know, where it's more of a volume license, and if you have any tips on that, and how to sort of actually penetrate um, enterprises. Oh. Hmm? Just, just repeat the question. Before you okay, so it was uh, tips on the enterprise license and how to penetrate the enterprise. So we, you know, we knew we always wanted to focus on the enterprise, but we did not feel that our product was mature enough or ready enough to really go after that and build out you know, our, our apparatus to be able to sell and market towards the enterprise. So we actually had you know, a bunch of inbound requests from enterprises that wanted us within their workplace because they saw you know, the value that it could provide, you know, both in terms of productivity but I think a lot of enterprises look at this as you know, a competitive advantage in terms of recruiting as well, because we're messenger first and you know, the kind of up and coming millennial generation is entering the workforce and has entered the workforce. I think they saw this as a way of making their you know, legacy enterprise company kind of like cool and hip and something that appealed to that younger demographic. Um, but yeah, we're, we're still kind of playing around with it. You know, we kind of, we looked at Slack and the way that they did things and thought that that you know, made a lot of sense. Um, and you know, with, with our first large enterprise client, you know, we, th this, this, this isn't really for us to learn about how to sell to them. Like we are, you know, we do do that and we do need to do that. But I think a lot of it's more focused on, you know, how do you deploy this within an enterprise? What are the best practices? You know, how do you communicate this to all of the different departments and all of the different use cases when you have a multi-feature bot? And you know, how do you do with, deal with all the security concerns and regulations that come along with you know, selling to the enterprise as well, especially you know, when you're you know, kind of sucking in users' data and the company's data and you, know, you have access to the conversation logs that they have with your product. Mm, okay. Well, thanks for listening.